Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at the second part of my Windows 11 challenge from the perspective of a Linux user right after this. So one of the things that um, there was actually a number of, of, of generalized things that I had to accomplish this week. First, I had to get Windows set up to stream. And the second piece was to install a game. Now, streaming has a number of dependencies, as you probably can imagine. First of all, you need an audio driver in order to hook up your mic so that you can talk to people and they can hear what you're trying to say. The, of course, the second component is the streaming software itself. And then the third component is what do you do with the video file once you have created it? You need to edit it, but you need to place it someplace to store it permanently. And that's the part that I also need. And that would be an NFS support in order to move that video file up to the network so that I can then work on it from the systems that I use to do the video editing with. So, uh, so those are the components that I need to install. And then... OpenSSH from last week, I need that in order to be able to manage the server. So I need the open SS, I need the uh, SSH server component, and then I need the client component in order to sign into and administer, if I want, uh, the servers that I have uh, and that are Linux servers. So those are needed for me. Now, last week, I, I told you I was going to use Bitwise SSH server and Bitwise SSH client because they do offer a GUI in order to be able to do these functions and it works, seems to work pretty well. But I got some, uh, cl I got some feedback from some of you that said, oh, hey, Microsoft already has SSH. You don't have to install a third party app. Now I thought I was pretty clear that I didn't want, I'll say it again. Linus had said he doesn't have to use the command line on Windows very often. And so he thought it was odd that Linux had a command line in order to do basic um, servicing of the system. If I put on, now as it turns out, OpenSSH is a command line app. It is under Linux too, by the way. So that would violate what Linus was talking about. That puts me clearly on the command line, which Linus says you don't have to do. So yeah, so I don't really find that option too viable, but I did go through the install steps just to try it. So I'll talk about that today, what I ran into. The third component was NFS because that's the service that I use on my client, on my servers. Am I going to use SMB? Hell no. No, I'm not. Uh, I, I, uh, my servers are set up to cross-connect by NFS, and I'm not changing everything over to use SMB. Sorry, not going to do it. <laughs> um that's my work. That's my work choice, and that's what I'm sticking with. So let's talk a little bit about setting up uh, the audio driver. So I use an Apogee Digital. It's a Duet interface. It's been around a while. It's a USB interface. has pretty good uh, has pretty good uh, preamplifiers in it for the microphones, and it works quite well. It was originally designed to work on Mac OS only. So, or Mac OS 10, as it was back in the day when they first released their software and their hardware. This is a uh, a two device interface, so I can have uh, I can have two devices plug it in, and there's also you can connect a number of other ones via via a digital interface if you choose. And then there's uh, two output direct outputs, and then there's two outputs to go to speakers as well with it. Uh, it is it you know. Um, a couple of, I think it's been five or six years ago, they released a driver for Windows. I have never tried it under Windows, so I installed the driver and connected, moved the USB connection over and connected fine. It seems to talk to everything just fine as well. So, yeah, all that seems to be working just great. Uh, as far as uh, OBS, which was the next piece I needed, uh, that went swimmingly well, which, of course, you would expect. Uh, it is a native application for Windows, and, in fact, I believe they do their development on Windows first. And then they create a number of versions of OBS, one for Linux and one for Mac OS. I think that's the only three they actually offer support for. But uh, the, the feature-rich application is Windows. That is... Uh, the most feature rich, and I think it's kind of their place where they add new features, and then over time they roll them out to Linux and Mac OS. 
Mac OS would uh, would be the second most feature rich, and then followed by Linux, which is the least feature rich uh, in terms of what the capabilities are from the base package that's installed under Windows. So I did install NVENC, uh, which is the native uh, support for NVIDIA graphics hardware so that it will then transfer any uh, transcoding work over to the graphics card for support. Now, I don't know if this graphics card that I have on this Lenovo is powerful enough to really survive an NVENC onslaught, but we'll find out. It, 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 may, be, it may be faster to use the CPU. I, I don't know. <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, but anyway, that went fine. No big deals there. It wouldn't expect to. Uh, but the problems came up when I went to install SSH and SSH and NFS. So tr the documentation that's out on the internet is dated. I know that Linus had said this was true of Linux. It's also true of Windows. Uh, so a lot of the times it will point you to uh, using something called programs and features, which is an obsolete uh, an entry in the uh, in the utilities, so it's now called apps. So that trying to find that finally, yeah. And then where do you find it in this? Is it under apps and features? Is it under default apps, offline apps, optional apps for websites, uh, video playback? Of course, I wouldn't expect it there. It is actually right here. Uh, and you you can add optional features here. You can view the features. And if you scroll down this list, you will find, well, it's, it's already installed. So it, I think it pulls it off this list. Yeah, but it's here. It would normally be here. Now, of course, on my server, because I have installed them, they are appearing right here. Open SSH client and server because they're already installed that I installed them. The, the client actually was already installed. The server piece was not. So um, the only other thing, I, I ran into a couple of problems with the SSH. Let's talk about the server first. So I have the Bitwise server installed. This is my fault. I will accept the responsibility for that. I had it up and running, and I went to install the server and start it, and of course, it failed. The, the cryptic error message I got pointed me down. A, I didn't even think about the Bitwise server being up and running. Uh, and <laughs> it sent me down this path of, permission denied, which is, oh, that usually means that the account that you're using as that service it lacks sufficient privileges to create files on the file system in the areas that it needs to. So, I mean, <laughs> Linux, on the other hand, if you have the, if the port is in use, it says port in use. It doesn't say permission denied. So anyway, I figured out that, that BitLive was up and running and then stopped it and brought up the server. No big deal. My fault. I accept I accept responsibility for that. Uh, OpenSSH client, however, is feature incomplete. Uh, it does not have all of the same features that Linux does. Now, what things are missing? So it has the basic SSH and SFTP. Those are there. Uh, it also has uh, the ability to create keys. The key gen utility is there, although it is kind of weird that you can exit, you can act, this is weird. You can put in SSH and then your string to connect to the server and that works fine. You can put in SFTP, your string, and connect to the server just fine. But for some strange reason, if you want to generate a key, you have to say SSH underscore key gen dot exe. I don't know why. But if you don't put the .exe file in there, it won't find it. So Microsoft fixed that. That's stupid <laughs> that you allow it on everything else, but not the key gen. That's just bizarre. The piece that's missing, however, is there is a utility on Linux. It's been there for some time. It's called uh, ssh-copy-id. And what that does is it allows me to uh, sign in to my remote server and it automatically installs the public key for me. So I don't have to do that. And the next time I sign in, I don't have to use my uh, password anymore as long as I have a key that's legitimate. Um, and so, yeah, that, I mean, that I just find that just really bizarre that they're missing it. So uh, the workaround for that is to employ what we did 12 years ago on Linux, which is to make a, an S to FTP connection to your host manually copy the public key over to the host and then 
exit out of the SFTP, sign back in as SSH, get a terminal window, and and then concatenate the ID, uh, the 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 public key to the end of the authorized uh, the authorized host file, which it's just uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know whether Microsoft you're using a really old version of OpenSSH or whether you just blew off installing all the optional pieces. So I, I'm, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I didn't actually check which version they're really running. Uh, as far as the server component, like I said, it all went fine. The only other thing, I mean, I'm, the only thing I ran into is I, you do have to have a local account in order to connect uh, unless you happen to know what your Microsoft password is. And of course, Microsoft is trying to move away from passwords. So that's probably not going to be the, the uh, yeah, the keen thing. You'll have to create a user, a, a local user account would be my recommendation with that. And now we come to NFS. Um, so I went out and I, I looked to see, and I remembered that I had heard from some other YouTubers that NFS was now supported under Windows. You always hear generalized statements like that. And those generalized statements are often wrong. And they're wrong in this case too. So where does Microsoft actually support NFS? So if you want the server and the client, you have to have Windows Server for that in order to install it. Makes sense, right? I mean, it makes sense. But if you want the client version of NFS, can you put that on home? No. <laughs> no. There is no, there is no support on Microsoft Windows Home, whether it be 10, 11, or whatever. There is no support for NFS, which I find very weird that the... The, there was some documentation that alluded to using uh, Windows 10 Enterprise, but I remember that Microsoft, it's been a while ago that they had moved some of the features of Enterprise down to Pro. And so I thought, well, I have a version, I have a license for Pro on 10. Let me go see if NFS is over there. And sure enough, it was. I find this really weird. Uh, I find this weird because you have a company that's, that's, that's boasting that it supports open source and it loves Linux. And yet, they don't provide the basic open source tools. And by the way, NFS is open source, Microsoft, in case you didn't know that. That you don't have to charge your users extra to, for the privilege of running NFS. So why isn't NFS available on home? That's my question to you. I don't think Microsoft cares what I think, but why isn't it there? Why do I have to pay you extra and the license in order for you to provide open source software that you don't support anyway. So I just, I, I don't get it. So anyway, uh, once I discovered that, and it was a pro license version, I went and tested it on Office, on uh, Microsoft 10. So on Windows 10, I should say. So uh, let me tell you what my outcomes <laughs> were with that. So there, uh, first of all, uh, the mount command that they recommend on the different websites that document, that bother to document this, indicate that you have to be on the command line to do the mount. And then you you do a mount, and then you do a minus O, and then, and then the, and the word anon. That means that you are passing the credentials of anonymous to the NFS server. Anonymous generally means to Linux that, oh, this account is not logged in. It's, it's an anonymous account, like an anonymous FTP. So... Linux will not grant read-write connections to that, that particular session. So you're, in my case, that's not going to help me at all. That won't help me at all. So, But there is a workaround that is published by these websites. And, and this is not Microsoft. This is people that use Windows, and this is what they're claiming that you should do to work around this problem. Uh, they recommend that you go in to regedit and create two entries, one, and there's documentation out there. I'm not going to go through it, but I, I will provide you links if, you, if you're if you interested and want to do this on your own. But uh, you have to go to RegEdit and you need to key, create two keys. One is anonymous UID and anonymous GID, which is user ID, group ID. And they recommend, because the default for Anon is two for both the user ID and group ID, they recommend you change this to zero. Now, what does that do? That means that you have, that you're connecting as anonymous to your Linux server 
and you're passing the credentials that you are root. So you're a root user attaching anonymously to an NFS server. And that, of course, will give you read and write access. It also will grant you other privileges that you probably didn't intend. <laughs> Not a good idea is the bottom line. If you follow that advice, you probably have a security hole, a major, a big one in your uh, in your servers. So I wouldn't recommend following that advice. So I need to test to see if I can pass a local account, a, a, a different UID and GID to that. So I limit the exposure of my read-write access to my host. I'm certainly not going to grant root access to, to, to an NFS server. Not going to happen, no. Um, so, uh, and that really was the issue. Uh, as far as being able to do the mount from the, from the file explorer, so yeah, you can do it from the map uh, device, and that works just fine. So... Uh, it, if you have the NFS client installed, it will do this. So it will allow you to, and it, you just follow the same. Now, it is a little quirky uh, in that when you when you do the mount initially, it wants you to pass uh, your credentials. So you put in anon, and then you leave a password off, and then it comes back and it asks you again for anon and password. You put in anon with no password, and it lets you go through, lets you push through it, which. Uh, yeah, it's kind of bizarre uh, that, that that that's the way it works, but that's the way it works. So that's really the issues that I had with this. Um, yeah, I would like, if you really are committed to open source Microsoft, why just support NFS client on Pro? The other issue with NFS on Windows 11 or 10, there is no server component available, which is weird because... OpenSSH has the server component available, but NFS is not. You have to go to the, at least this is what I have seen, and I, maybe you guys can ferret out of there how to get an NFS server up and running on this. I'm sure you can hack it into the system, but there is no official way of doing it. So I'll put it that way. So that's all I had for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at how much open source I can install. And as you can see, I've already installed uh, VLC and OBS, those are two open source pieces of software that also run on Linux. So that's what I'll be doing. I'll be looking at my library of open source software that I use. I'm going to try to push as much of that over to uh, over to Windows 11 as I can and see what, how much I get away with and how much and what kind of problems I run into. Hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon, and bye for now.